We're very grateful to everyone for joining us. For those of you who haven't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Amelia Wald. I'm the club's, the Virginia Club of New York's executive director. And we are so happy to have this program tonight, which is between our two prospective communities of interest, um, who's entrepreneurs, and then Wahoo Law, who's entrepreneurs, obviously is for um, both active and aspiring entrepreneurs. And then Wahoo Law is for attorneys who either came from UVA undergrad or UVA law school. So we're very grateful to them and their communities for bringing everyone together for this very informative session. A couple of housekeeping notes, as I said earlier, you all will begin by being muted. We ask that you stay that way throughout the course of the presentation. There will be an option at the end of the presentation for Q&A. We suggest that you write your questions in the chat. Feel free to do that at any point during the presentation if a question comes to mind. And then at the end of the presentation, our moderator, Allison, will go ahead and select questions from the Q&A. This program is being recorded tonight, just so you're aware. So if you have to drop off at some point, or if you're unable to stay for the entire program, you can go ahead and check out that recording later. That recording will be live in about the next two weeks. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Allison and she's gonna take care of us for the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you so much to the Virginia Club of New York for facilitating this event. And thank you um, everyone for coming. Um, and to our panelists for taking part of this. I think it's going to be very informative and valuable. Um, so as Amelia said, I'm Allison Geller. I um, am the founder of Who's an Entrepreneurship via the Virginia Club of New York. Um, I founded it because we have this amazing community of UV entrepreneurs. Wanted to be able to bring everyone together, provide both practical advice and moral support for everyone who is engaged in entrepreneurial pursuits or is thinking about it. We're kind of, you know, very much welcoming every everyone at every stage. So. Um, I will now um, go ahead and share our presentation that we put together today um, and introduce our panelists. So this is also, we will we'll also be um, um, sharing the presentation so you guys don't have to worry about taking notes. So. All right, does everyone see this on their screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so just to run through some quick introductions, we have a lot of really great content we wanna get through, so I'm gonna make it pretty brief. So as I said, my name is Allison. Um, in addition to being the founder of this group, I am one half of GNT Creative, a marketing creative agency serving food and beverage and food tech brands. Um, to move on to our real experts here, um, we are welcoming George Akers and Alex Shin um, from Nelson Mullins Law Firm, uh, both UVA alums, um, and they work with a lot of startup companies advising on general corporate matters, entity formation, equity financing, corporate governance, and much more. So they're going to be kind of leading our content from the legal side. We have Rich Boone, who is a lawyer by day, entrepreneur by night. Um, he is a partner at Wilson Elzer here in New York. He is also um, co-founder of a private equity firm. He's the co-founder of two independent vending and food service startups. So he's kind of repping both sides of the house. And then finally, we are welcoming Chad Razdan, who is our, um, our pure entrepreneur perspective. He's got a lot of great stories to share kind of from the trenches. He is the co-founder and CEO of Karenware, a company that designs innovative healthware that brings humanity back into healthcare. So thank you everyone uh, so much for joining. So we're going to move uh, through our content um, fairly swiftly, but as Amelia said, please do take the opportunity to ask questions. You can ask them via the chat box. Um, if you have questions along the way, we'll do our best to answer them, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end um, where you can raise your hand and, and, and ask your question verbally. Um, so keep in mind, uh, all these topics, could we could go into a lot more detail about all of them. They could kind of each be their own hour. Um, so this is just kind of think of this as a general overview. Um, but we do have the advantage of this, this fabulous brain trust here tonight. So, so don't be shy about asking your more specific questions as well. Um, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is entity choice. So when I'm starting a company, what kind of structure should I use? What should I be? How do I determine the pros and cons? Alex, would you like to start? You're muted, Alex. Oh, Alex, we can't hear you. Can, can everyone hear me now? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, George is muted as well for future. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, future. I was trying sorry to tell that. him to unmute himself while I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> I had a well, very Zoom moment there. <laughs> again, thank you um, for everyone for being here. And thank you, Allison, for your introduction. Um, thrilled to be here. Thrilled to be sharing our thoughts and experience. Um, just to start us off, as, uh, as Allison just said, um, entity choice um, is obviously something we're going to talk about. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of different types of business forms that you can start your business with, um, but probably the two most common forms that we see are LLCs or, or the limited liability companies or, um, um, and corporations. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, LLCs here. Um, probably one of, the, one of the very key benefits of starting your business as an LLC is that you can limit your liability um, of debts arising from acts or emissions of business to the assets of the business as opposed to having um, any liability flow through to you as an individual um, if something happens um, you know, in, in the course of operating your business. Um, so that's probably one of the very, very like um, key aspects that should be on top of your mind if you're sort of starting a business. Um, the, the second thing that's also very much uh, important is that um, with an LLC, you have, an, you have an option to elect to be taxed as a partnership, which means that um, the business pays actually no taxes. So the tax actually flows through to the own, like individual owners of the business who pay their business taxes through their own personal tax returns. And this option also allows you to use losses to offset your, your gains. Now, um, stepping back to uh, the liability issue, one of the things that you want to keep in mind, though, is that there's this concept called piercing, corp piercing the corporate veil, which means um, that, you know, sure, like if you, if you have an LLC, then um, conceptually you're shielded from personal liability. But uh, if something happens and you go to court um, with somebody who's uh, putting in a claim against you, um, the court may actually decide um, to, quote unquote, um, pierce the corporate veil meaning um, that the owners of the business may be held liable if the court finds that, that there is no real separation between the business and the individuals, um, or if the company's actions were um, blatantly wrongful or fraudulent. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that um, small um, or closely held businesses are often, um, you know, more, more often subject to such piercing of corporate bail because um, there's higher chance of, you know, of, of you blurring the lines between the business, running a business and, and your personal, um, personal aspects. All right, so that's like the uh, basics of the LLC. Um, we're gonna touch on this a little bit more, but um, there's also a, uh, um, there's an aspect of LLC that, that there's a downside. Like if, you, if you're actually looking to grow your business to, to, um, to a large scale where um, if, you, if you end up, if you get to a point in your business where you start, uh, start involving um, institutional investors, then um, they may actually um, require you to, to switch over to a, a corporation form. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later when we talk about corporations. All right, so speaking of which, on the next slide, um, the other form that's probably most, most often seen is, is a corporation. Um, there, there's a C Corp and an S Corp, um, basically refers to a subsection of the relevant tax code. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest benefits of, of um, forming a corporation, um, much like an LLC, as we just talked about, it also limits liability uh, in a very similar manner that we just discussed. Uh, that our LLC does. Now, um, the, the one drawback and probably one of the biggest differences between an LLC and a C Corp um, is that a C Corp can be, um, can be subject to double taxation, um, especially if, uh, you know, if, if there's a sale uh, of your company and if the sale, such sale is structured as an asset sale, uh, what, what could happen is um, your, your business is taxed and then um, whatever, the, whatever the personal gain you, you, you reap, uh, whatever the windfall that ends up with you personally, 
uh, you can also get taxed on that um, on the personal side. So that's one of the um, differences between a C corp and, a, and an LLC. Now, if you have an S corp, S corp also limits liability in a similar manner, uh, but uh, S corp actually allows you to pass through a tax agent just like an LLC does. Uh, but the reason that an S corp is relatively pretty rare is because there are a bunch of other restrictions um, if you form an S corp. Um, some of the examples of these restrictions are um, that you can only have one class of stock. Um, also, you can uh, you can have you you, you can have a hundred or more shareholders, um, and your your um, shareholders have to be natural persons. So you can't you can't have like an investment fund. Uh, make a make an invest investment in your company if you're an S corp, and also your uh, shareholders or investors uh, cannot be a foreign person. Um, so you know if you're forming like a small uh, mom and pop shop uh, and you don't really have an aspiration to grow your business to be uh, really large, then S corp actually might work. But typically, like it's it's relatively rare to see an S corp, um, compared at least compared to a C corp or an LLC. All right, um, so. Earlier, I touched a little bit on, um, you know, bringing in institutional investors. Uh, so when you when you when you get to um, a point in your business, um, you, you've grown it enough to uh, where you're uh, starting to uh, involve real like venture capital institutional investors. They might require you to be uh, become a, a, a Delaware C corp if you're not already. Um, why C corp? A um, couple of reasons, there are, there are um, certain tax restrictions on tax exempt investors in, in a venture capital fund that uh, may prevent them from investing in LLCs because of the LLCs pass through a taxation structure. Um, so uh, sometimes like to sort of uh, sidestep this, you might see what's called a blocker parent C Corp entity um, that the investor will, investor will invest in and the blocker will own the underlying LLC as a subsidiary. So that's, that's an option that you can typically explore to sidestep this issue. Now, um, I also mentioned Delaware, uh, that, that a lot of institutional investors uh, might require your business to, to be a Delaware LLC or Delaware um, C Corp. The re like, there are a bunch of reasons for this, um, but some of them are, you know, the state of Delaware just has a really long history of dealing with private businesses so the state just has a really extensive and robust body of case laws uh, that provide um, a lot of clarity on um, issues uh, that, that arise in connection with private businesses. And uh, the corporate, uh, and very importantly, the corporate statutes of, um, are, are also very well developed and, and very clear on a lot of issues. Um, and then of course, from the business perspective, this is just as important is that the Delaware law is very favorable, uh, generally very favorable to, to management. Um, so that's all, uh, one thing to keep in mind. And then of course the court, um, the, the business court um, that's called Court of Chancery in Delaware, uh, it you know, has a wealth of experience um, uh, in, in dealing with private businesses. So the courts tend to be a lot more sophisticated and, than the comparable um, courts in other states. Um, and then uh, like on a very like practical standpoint, the Delaware Secretary of State, uh, where you would go, um, go to form your business, um, you know, you know, putting all the filings of the documents um, is very efficient. And, you know, you can even, you know, do a charter filing that, that can be done within an hour. So Alex, if I am not planning on taking any kind of VC money, if that's not really my business, um, does it matter where I file for my um, my LLC or my corporation, whatever I decide? Yeah, um, George, you want to chime in uh, on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it matters a little bit um, in terms of you know the the corporate law that might apply that you know uh, for the state that you operate in. Um, you know, maybe there's some things that are a little bit more convenient about one. Uh, state um, than another, but I would say on the whole, uh, it's it's probably not a huge difference. I mean, and again, there are some states that are going to be more deferential to management as opposed to stockholders. Like California is going to be much more, you know, uh, favorable to, to stockholders. Delaware is going to be more favorable to to management and boards of directors. Um, but those are really mostly concerns for for companies that are going to be larger and, and having to deal with. Um, issues uh, 
that a mom and pop operation probably isn't going to have to deal with. So if you're just going to be like a family company running your family business, you know, you don't anticipate having a huge list of stockholders and, and lots of corporate governance issues to deal with over time. I think it really doesn't matter too much. Um, you're probably good to just incorporate in whatever state you're located in. Um, and that has some conveniences uh, to it. You can avoid having to, to get what's called a registered agent if you were going to incorporate in a foreign state. So you could just be your own registered agent. And the registered agent is just somebody who receives service of process and filings, uh, notices from the state um, on, uh, on the company's behalf. So if somebody was gonna sue your company, the registered agent's the person that receives those mailings. Um, so yeah, if you're just going to be doing a small business, uh, I think it's, it probably makes sense to just incorporate locally in, in the state that you're located in. Got yeah, it. One, one, one thing I'd add to that when I'm not, uh, starting companies, I'm, I'm a DNO litigator. And so I see, you know, when, when the director's offices of corporations get sued for things, I see a lot of that. And, and one thing that, that, uh, you might want to look out for when you're choosing your state of incorporation is that. And everybody knows that the federal government and the SEC regulates securities offerings, uh, but the states do too, and each has their own set of laws. Uh, and the, for the most part, they mimic the federal laws, but uh, in various states, you can have what I would term weird securities laws, um, and Delaware does not. So you're relatively safe under, under state securities laws in Delaware. Uh, if not, if you want to you know, incorporate in another state, that might be something you want to look into. So we have a couple of questions coming in actually about the, um, the feasibility of changing either which state you're incorporated in, going from an LLC to a C-Corp or an S-Corp, for example, um, or if you are a C-Corp registered in New Jersey and you want to change to Delaware, if you're looking to raise money, how difficult is this? So I can, I can speak to these real quickly. So, and I also, I also noticed there was a question about how often uh, or some examples of when the corporate veil has been pierced. Yeah. Honestly, I, I just have never seen it happen. I think it's fairly rare for the corporate veil to actually be pierced, but you know, maybe just in my world and the types of companies I work with, it's, it's just not something that's done. But again, I think like Alex mentioned, if it's like a small, you know, small business, maybe like you know, I'm the sole shareholder and it's just my personal corporation. That's probably more where you're going to start to see maybe some issues there. But a typical company, um, it's probably not going to be an issue that, that comes up uh, in, in, in those cases. Um, and then as far as the difficulty of changing the state that you're incorporated in, it's, it's fairly easy to, to just file conversion paperwork uh, to convert your, your entity to another state's entity. However, not every state has conversion statutes, so you might have to do a conversion by way of merger. Um, so, um, uh, however, you know, a lot of states do have conversion statutes, so it's really just a matter of filing a, a few pieces of paperwork, a, a certificate of conversion in uh, the state you're in and the state you want to be in, um, and then doing some, some other paperwork related to that. But um, it's not too hard, but there are consequences if you were to switch from, for example, being an S corp to not being an S corp from a tax perspective. So before you, you know, make a change like that, you also want to talk to your accountants and make sure you're not going to trigger any, uh, any negative tax consequences by, by making a change. Great. Um, now Chad, I know you had some personal experience with this yourself. Could you share that with us? Yeah. So we, um, like every founder, um, we are of, were of the belief that we were obviously going to be a rocket ship immediately when we started uh, and that we were going to raise VC funding immediately and so became a Delaware C Corp. Um, I think the thought was we would save the couple thousand dollars in legal fees that um, it costs us to make that change in the future. Um, one of the big lessons that I've learned and a lot of other founders I've learned is the first few years, uh, you're normally not coming out of the gate making a profit. Uh, you're normally burning cash and losing money. And so if um, we had um, been smart, we probably would have made ourselves an LLC at the beginning and taken the tax write-offs from the losses from the business. Um, instead, we did not, and so those losses went to the company, 
as an NOL, uh, sorry, a net operating loss. And so we'll be able to write it off as a company this year, uh, which my investors are thrilled about, but um, just was a lost opportunity uh, to save some money in the earliest days. Yeah, we, we do the opposite with our companies. We usually start them as LLCs. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we, we have a, a different corporate structure. We usually run uh, an operating company and then uh, and, and we run operating subs and then a holding company that holds everything. Uh, the idea is that we raise the money into the holding company and then we'll ultimately probably convert that into corporations when we take on real money. But we, we just like the LLC format to get started because it's the most flexible. Uh, there's the pass through, you know, tax treatment and things. Um, and it, it's just really easy to, to get an LLC started and it's not that hard to convert it to a corporation later. Um, so, you know, my, my sort of default is when in doubt, just, you know, get running under an LLC and then, and then when you get all of your legal representation, everything, you know, in place, handle all the corporation stuff. But um, if you know you're going to do some sort of specific task and you know you're going to take on big investors, certainly going chats route would be, you know, a good way to go. You save a step, but uh, you don't really lose anything by starting as an LLC. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you both. Um, so this is a table we can kind of, um, Alex and George, unless you have anything in particular to add to this, we'll kind of leave this here as reference when we send this out that you can kind of uh, look at the features of each type of entity laid out, um, some terminology as well. Um, anything to add to this, um, Alex and George? Not for me. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. I, I do find very, pretty often actually when I'm dealing with uh, small businesses, like, you know, people, like, this is a very, very, like, nitty-gritty, like, practical, um, you know, situations, but, like, people do tend to get, like, confused um, mm -hmm. uh, between terminologies, like, you know, in, you know, it doesn't have a lot of, like, consequential, um, you know, impacts, but, you know, just to know that the owners of the business, like, if you're a corporation, they're called shareholders, they're called members if you're an LLC, um, or like the charter, like the you know, which is which is basically the official document that you file with the Secretary of State of um, where, where you incorporate your business. Um, it's called if you're a corporation, it's called either a certificate of incorporation or article of incorporation. Or if you're an LLC, it's called articles of organization or certificate of formation. It's you know, just like there isn't a whole lot of substance, substantive consequence of, of confusing these terms, but just to. Um, I find that on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm dealing with my clients, um, you know, like conversations sometimes mm -hmm. go a little bit, um, get a little awkward because um, people are misunderstanding some of the terminologies. It's better if we all know a little bit what we're talking about so we can right. sound That's smart right. and having conversations. Um, so we have a question. Are membership interest units in an LLC usually set up as a percentage of company or shares? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Yes, our membership interest units in an LLC usually set up as a percentage of the company or shares? Uh, I can speak to that real quick. So I, I see it more often, not as shares, but as units. That's typically the terminology that's used in the context of an LLC. Um, and the value of that is then you can issue more units and you don't have to change. Mm -hmm. Having a percentage is weird because it's a floating number, right? So if you issue more equity to somebody, it's, it's diluting somebody else down, mm -hmm. which is just, it's kind of messy and hard to keep track of. So what best practice in my view is if you just give everybody a fixed absolute number of units that represent the, the starting equity ownership percentage breakdown that you want to have and then you issue more units over time and it just, it's easier to operate that way, I find. Yep, makes sense. Um, all right, so then briefly, we have a few other types of entities that we could elect. Um, Alex, why or why not and what are these? Yeah, um, so you, we, we talked about the dominant forms of businesses and LLCs and corporations. Obviously there are other forms such as full proprietorship, um, partnership, public benefit corporation, nonprofit corporation, among others. Um, sole proprietorship, as the slide indicates, we typically don't recommend. And the biggest reason is that, you know, because of liability, you know, the, if, if, you, if you're running a business as a sole proprietorship and something happens, um, then, you know, the liability flows directly to you as an individual so that you don't want to, you don't want to avoid, you want to avoid that situation at all costs. 
So that's one, that's a key reason we don't recommend a sole proprietorship. Although um, it is pretty popular, generally speaking, um, only because it's just easy to set up and easy to, easy to just take apart. Um, but again, not recommended. Um, partnership, um, it's, you know, um, we don't really see a whole lot of, uh, we don't really see partnership um, form in, in like a regular um, bit like startup business um, that, that offers specific products. Um, we, we see partnerships in, more often in setting you know, in like investment funds. Um, Cause otherwise like, you know, if, for, for like a regular startup business, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to structure them. So there are a couple of things. Great. Yeah, there, I mean, there's also three different kinds of partnerships. It's just a common law partnership, which is me and Allison decide we have a corporation, we're going to have a company and we're immediately a partnership. Uh, it's just like having a sole proprietorship. We're both completely liable. We're actually, we're both totally liable for the for whatever the business does. So if there's a debt that the business owes, they could sue Allison for it, they could sue me for it, or they could sue both of us for it. And there's like limited liability partnerships, which is kind of like an LLC, but it's for partnerships and it, and it limits the liability of each of the partners. And then there's what's called a limited partner, which is what uh, is almost always used for investment vehicles. We use them, uh, we'll talk about later for our friends and family investments, but it, a limited partnership is, is one person or entity is on the hook and is personally liable for all of everything the partnership does. And then everybody else who invests in the partnership has limited liability, so they can't go after them. Um, and that, that's good as like an investment vehicle. I think we'll talk about that when we talk about fundraising, um, but there's many different flavors of partnership. Great, thank you. Um, so now moving on, um, let's talk about protecting intellectual property, which is our next topic. So what does this really mean? Um, when and why does it matter, Alex? Yeah, so um, you know there are obviously a lot of different um, topics you want to you, you know, that, that are important to you um, for 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 businesses that that are you know particularly tech companies, but but also any other types of businesses that um, offer tangible products. Um, intellectual property is, is very very important as. Um, you know, it's, it's some, sometimes like for, for, like, for example, software tech company, IP might, might be your only real asset. Um, but, but, you know, for, for other many different types of businesses that offer like tangible products, like IP is, a, it, is it might one of the underlying assets that you have, like the, from, from which your business really flows. Um, now, there are three types of registrable intellectual property. Um, patent, there's trademark, and there's copyright. Um, now, patent issues arise most often with hardware tech companies, but um, just generally speaking, intellectual property, registrable intellectual property can be applicable to any, any businesses, um, you know, and even patent. You know, for example, you might have like a design patent on, on jewelry company, which clearly is not a tech company. Um, so those are some of the, those are like the basics of the IP. Um, now, uh, when you when you start a company um, that has an IP, one of the first things you want to do, um, especially if you have two or more owners, two or two or more founders, is that you want to sign an IP assignment agreement um, among the founders um, to to make it you know just make thing make it clear who owns which IP and like whatnot um, to to make you know so that you don't have any disputes later. And you also want to uh, make sure that your employees sign um, an employment agreement that has covenants um, that, it, you know, the covenants for IP assignment um, and also like, you know, related confidentiality, um, non-solicit of employees and even customers and sometimes even non-compete. And then, and then um, even, even, even beyond that, um, you, you want to make sure any um, and all third-party contractors that you, you end up working with, um, and especially those who, who actually help you help, help your business develop any additional IPs, um, sign an independent contract contractor agreement that has um, similar IP assignment provisions. Um, now, this is you know so when when you're talking about employees um, and and talking to them about uh, these IP matters. Uh, the general assumption is that um, whatever 
um, whatever IP that your employee helps your company develop um, is considered typically uh, generally considered work for hire and, and, and the ownership of such IP um, belongs to your company unless otherwise um, agreed to. Um, but with, with third party contractors, that's not actually the case. Uh, that's not a default um, setting. So you partic particularly dealing with um, your third party contractors, you wanna make sure that you have those agreements um, in place, crystal clear um, to everyone involved. Um, you know, like, you know, we obviously with tech companies, um, the, these things come up um, uh, very often. So for example, software companies typically rely on, on trade secret or sometimes even unregistered copyright protection rather than pat patent protection. And, um, you know, so that though these things are just um, like some of the some of the basic agreements and provisions you want to have in place um, at, uh, up front. Great. Um, and now, Chad, I know you also have some experience in this uh, this side of things. Would you like to share? Yeah, we um, so we're a product company. I'm actually wearing um, one of our products is a hoodie we designed with Oscar De La Renta. Um, and on all of our products, we like to get a patent uh, wherever possible. Um, and kind of like what Alex was saying, but there's two different types of patents. Uh, there's a utility patent and a design patent. And a design patent, unfortunately, is not as strong. Um, so for example, if you have a zipper on a shirt, like these are, this is actually a zipper that opens up. Um, if I made a zipper somewhere else, that wouldn't be under the same design patent. But if I was able to argue uh, that it had a strong utility to have a zipper on a shirt and you could get access to it and no one else had ever created something like that, I could then get a utility patent and that would be a lot more protectable. So we have, um, I think nine or, I was trying to count uh, earlier, I think we have like nine or 10 uh, utility patents and then one design patent um, just trying to protect our IP as much as possible and the getting people to sign an IP assignment is super important um, and later we'll talk about founders and co-founders um, it's really important that even the founders sign it uh, to the company because that way if in the future you end up leaving uh, the company doesn't end up screwed that uh, it was assigned to you and you never gave the company the right. So like all of our patents have me on them. It has some employees on them. Every employee on our team uh, signs a non-disclosure and investment assignment agreement. Um, and that's really important. And then we also have trademarks and copyrights as a brand, um, which is somewhat important too, because you don't want your competitors to start using uh, your sayings or your brand copyrights, et cetera. Um, so all this stuff uh, ends up being super costly. It honestly is a bit of a snooze fest, but it's super important uh, for you and your company um, thinking about it and making sure that you're able to protect yourself, uh, which obviously makes you a lot more attractive to investors as well. Right, because invest investors like to see some, some real ownable IP, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I always tell our investors is it's kind of BS that we're um, getting all this IP because at the end of the day, we're likely, and all the lawyers are glaring at me, like, what's wrong with you? Um, but um, that we are likely not going to pursue legal action against anyone. But it's important also from a partnership standpoint when you're talking to bigger companies to be able to say, oh yeah, we have this patented and no one's going to be able to, uh, no one else is going to be able to uh, copy this. We have a unique way to go to market, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is super important and it's really a unique way to differentiate yourself from bigger companies and other startups in the future. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that, that if you, when you go talk uh, to, you know, traditional VC funds and people like that, it's one of the things that they really look for is, you know, do you, is your idea patentable? Do you have a patent? Um, and, and, and it might be a hindrance to funding if you haven't patented what you're doing. It depends on what kind of company you are. I mean, we, we have traditional products companies that like, our, our, our biggest IT worry is probably getting our trademarks registered and things like that. We're not doing anything novel, but we work with a tech company that, you know, has both, you know, process and design patents. Um, 
that are super important to them. And that's the first thing that, that everybody looks for uh, when they're talking about funding. They always ask for it on Shark Tank. So, um, so we've talked about patents, trademarks, copyrights a little bit. Um, Alex, how would you define trade secrets? Actually, I mean, I, George, you want to take on that one? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. Yeah. So it's, it's something, it's information that's not generally known to the public. It has economic value by virtue of its being not generally known. And it's something that you've taken reasonable measures to keep private or to keep it secret. So those are kind of the three factors, if you will, that define what a trade secret is. The best example of it, the best known example of a trade secret in the world is the Coca-Cola recipe. It's not a patented piece of intellectual property. It's not publicly known. It's not registered with anybody. It's just locked up in a safe somewhere in a bank, I think in Atlanta, uh, and kept secret as a trade secret. And that's, that's what it is. A lot of companies rely on uh, just trade secret um, at trade secrets as, as, their, as their intellectual property that, uh, you know, that drives a lot of value for the business. So that's, um, that's another aspect of intellectual property. And the great thing about it is it, it has indefinite shelf life. You know, a patent will expire, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and eventually, you know, I think a copyright right does, does run out and something falls into the public domain, but a trade secret is forever. So long as you keep it secret. Um, and so, uh, you know, and there's, there's remedial action that you can take if somebody misappropriates a trade secret. So there's some protection around it. Um, and a lot of companies rely on that. And I would say, if you're a software company out there, you're probably relying more so on basically unregistered copyright protection on your software code. And I guess maybe treating it like a, a trade secret as well. Um, and I, I see software companies more so rely on those aspects of IP protection than let's say filing for a patent, which is very expensive, time consuming, and you know, it, it, it just, ultimately doesn't make a lot of sense for a software company. Um, so. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so I see a couple more questions are coming in. Um, I'm going to save those to the end just so we can um, kind of move on with um, some of the other things that we wanted to cover, but thank you for your questions. Keep them coming. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to talk about was co-founder relationships. So everything's always really rosy and everyone's real optimistic at the beginning, but that, you know, everyone thinks they're the exception and they're all going to be fine. Right. It's like, it's like getting married. It doesn't always work out that way. So what are things that we, we should really know going into a partnership? Yeah. So um, when you're starting a business with um, two or more fa uh, founders, um, like, like Allison just pointed out, like, you know, initially you might, everything's peachy and rosy and everyone's in love, but you know, things have a way of sort of, getting sidetracked. Uh, one, of the, one of the common things that we recommend our clients um, at the outset of starting business um, to, to, to uh, put in place is to put in a vesting agreement, um, you know, also um, through, through a document um, known as stock restriction agreements um, to ensure that each founder really earns their equity by sticking around and contributing uh, towards growth, growth of the business. Uh, in other words, um, you know, the founders, uh, what, you know, so, so if you have this stock restriction agreement, uh, uh, what would happen, like your purpose of having this agreement is, um, you know, the, the founders would lose their equity if they leave the company early. And the sooner they leave, the more they will lose. Um, the typical um, vesting, um, structure is, is four years with one year so-called cliff. What that means is, um, you know, your, your intended equity ownership, like the entire uh, entirety of your equity ownership uh, will vest in four years. But, um, you know, initially it would, you know, it would, it would take a one year um, until 25% of your um, intended equity ownership vests. And then after that one year, um, you, you structure it so that um, you open your ownership, start vesting, vesting in equal monthly increments through the end of the four years. So that's the very common way to set up this vesting structure. Yeah, and one uh, thing I should mention, Alex, if you want me to go ahead and jump in here yeah, on the E3B. Course. So one, there's a tax thing I need to mention in connect, uh, entering into a vesting arrangement. So uh, 
you may have heard of something called an 83B tax election. This is a, an election that you file with the IRS. Uh, it has to be done within 30 days of you getting your stock that is subject to the forfeiture of uh, a vesting arrangement. And basically what this election is telling the IRS is, it's telling the IRS, I wanna be taxed today on the full value of my equity at today's value, which in many cases, or most cases, when you're just starting a business, the value of your equity is zero. So the tax, uh, you know, the taxable value of your, of your, of your stock is, is, is nothing. So obviously you wanna be taxed on the value today. If you don't make that election, Here's the problem that happens. Every time that there is a vesting event that occurs, so one year out, let's say you guys hit it out of the park with the business, and by the, by the time um, you know, you're a year into this business, the business is worth $10 million or something, um, you would be taxed uh, at that one year mark on the value of the business at that time, on the portion of your equity that is vesting at that time. So if 25% of your equity vests a year out, and the business is worth $10 million at that point, guess what? You now have a tax bill for uh, for the value of that 25% of that equity that vested at that time. So big nightmare. I mean, it's it's essentially like phantom in income. Like, you know, you didn't get any cash, but now you have a big tax bill uh, that you, you didn't get any cash to pay for. So uh, it, it, it's a major, major issue in startup companies and it's critical that uh, people talk to their accountants because I can't actually give tax advice. I'm, I'm a lawyer. So I tell my clients to talk to your accountant, consult them about whether to make this 83B election. And it's almost always going to make sense to do it. Uh, but it's critical not to miss it. It has to be filed within 30 days. If you don't make that deadline, it's really not easy to fix. And it creates a lot of problems. And investors care a lot about making sure that people made those filings on time. Uh, because they don't want, even though it's a personal tax problem for that person, a founder's personal tax problems can become the company's tax problems if they, if they are essentially have bankrupted themselves by, you know, uh, incurring these enormous tax bills through this, this not making this filing. Very good to know. Yeah, the, 80, the 83B election can become problematic even down the road. I mean, once you're, if you're starting and your company's not worth anything, you make the 83B election and your company is worth nothing. So you pay taxes on nothing right now. That's awesome, right? But you start your company, you go out and you raise some money um, and you had to say a dollar a share. And, you know, even a month after that, even a day after that, if you go out and you bring on somebody to be the CEO of your company or, or, or whatever, um, and uh, you give him $100,000, 100,000 shares, on day one, that's worth $100,000. If they make an 83B election, they get taxed on, on $100,000 right now, and they don't have any money in their pocket um, to pay the tax. So it can be a problem. The way that you get around that is with, um, instead of stock options and things like that, if you have a corporation, but there are no stock options for LLC. So you need to be, if you have an LLC and that's how you start out your business, you need to be careful with that. There are ways around it. Um, I was talking with George and Alex and everybody earlier. We use what's called a management incentive plan um, which is kind of a complicated way to give people what are essentially options, but they're not really options and they're not really shares. Um, so there are pitfalls. And, and one of the things you just have to understand when you're talking about vesting agreements or any kind of incentives that you're giving to founders or employees or whatever is the first question you have to ask is, am I going to get taxed on this? So we have another a question about the 83B election. Is it only required if there's equity subject to vesting? If you're fully vested, is there a need for that election? Yeah. So if if you're getting stock, you know, free and clear, it's not subject to vesting, then you would not need to file an 83B election. It's only applicable in the event that you're getting stock or equity. And at the same time, it's it's being subject to risk forfeiture. So if you don't have that risk of forfeiture through a vesting arrangement, then an 83B election is, is not necessary. Great. Um, all right, so moving on. So IT ownership and equity ownership is kind of the next factor of this um, of partnership agreements. Would you say that, Alex? Yeah, so we already touched on this when we we're talking about intellectual property in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, one of the things that as we already discussed, um, you want to make sure um, the agreement is clear on uh, among the owners is you know, who owns what, what IP, 
So that's that's another thing that you really want to sort of make sure that everybody has clear understanding of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, sort of similarly, um, you, you also want to make sure that um, your cap table um, is, is very clean, um, especially if you start, you know, getting more and more people involved, like your cap table uh, can become really complicated and sort of cumbersome. So that's like one thing to keep in mind um, early on so that things don't like sort of get out of control. Yeah, and the issue that kind of related to that, which you don't want to see if you're an investor coming in is, uh, you know, three guys started a company and, you know, uh, they all kind of contributed towards the development of the product. And then one of them got pissed off and left and nothing was ever, you know, no release was ever signed with that guy saying that he doesn't own anything in the company. You don't want a cloud on the ownership of the company. That's the issue that you want to avoid. So if somebody's going to make a break with the company that that could have a sort of a claim to equity in the company, you want to clean that up because investors are, are definitely going to want to make sure that there's no there's no cloud over the, the cap table. Mm. Yeah. Um, Chad, you want to share a little bit of your experience here? Sure. Um, so when I was in business school, um, we had created a mobile app um, and had four of us as co-founders and sadly didn't have a panel like this. So I had just decided to do what was easiest and split split equity evenly amongst the four of us. Um, And so we got into numerous cases and we also didn't clarify to the 50-50 ownership split and decisions and stuff. We idiotically decided at the beginning that we would all need to unanimously agree on things and so We had one person who never agreed, I think just because he thought it was funny to have discussions about things that made no sense um, and wasn't really pulling his weight, but we didn't want to fire him because we all had equal ownership and we weren't vesting over time. Um, Now I run a company um, where I had two uh, partners early on, um, one left pretty early on, uh, just realized that she didn't want to be a startup. She wanted to be at a big company making a lot of money. Um, And the other one left uh, for family reasons. And so because we had four-year vesting, um, they got what they earned, um, but didn't have the full amount. And so incentivizing both myself as well as future employees. I think the other thing to bring up that actually we don't talk about here is employee vesting as well for stock options. Um, So we, for our company, give everyone the same four year, um, the four year with one year cliff uh, option and everyone on our team has equity ownership. Um, There's actually a lot of startups here in New York now switching to a five year model and uh, some are even six years, which is kind of nuts, but The idea around vesting initially was this is how long it's going to take for a company to go uh, public Um, and so wanted to keep you around for that. Um, But now with companies taking 10 plus years to go public, um, it's a way to kind of continue to motivate people without having to give new grants every year. Yep, makes sense. So learn from chat, everyone. Um, Don't more, do it ever. <laughs> more to say about this, but in the interest of time, um, we're going to keep it moving. So next topic we wanted to cover very basics are um, just legal basics and consideration for raising early capital. So Alex and George, you want to take us through this? Yeah, we'll just like quickly run through these. Um, you know, so as, as the slide shows, um, you know, I, you start you start from you know, logically, you know, you start from close to yourself and small to, you know, farther and farther out and large and large. You know, um, you, you start with your own self-funding. Um, it's um, colloquially called bootstrapping in the space. Um, and then of course you move on to people that are close to you, like your family and friends. Um, some of the, some of the, some of the um, structures that, that are um, often recommended at this stage are um, using convertible though, which are what, what are called um, are called safes. Um, I think George George could probably talk about uh, talk more detail about these these options. Yeah, so these are two very similar types of instruments that are often used in the earliest stages of companies. So, convertible net is a convertible note is debt. Uh, it's an IOU. So the company takes money from somebody. They're saying I owe you this amount, but what it's saying is that it's not just regular debt. It's debt that will convert into equity 
at the next equity financing. So this is money to get you started. And the idea is when you go to raise a much larger round from an institutional investor in an actual bona fide equity round, this note will convert at that time into equity, but it converts at a discount to the price in that future round to, to account for the fact that this person's getting in earlier at a lower valuation. A safe is essentially the exact same thing, except it's not dead. It doesn't have an interest rate and it doesn't have a maturity date, but it's the same in every other respect. It's an instrument that was created by Y Combinator, which is an incubator or accelerator out on the West Coast um, a few years ago. And it's just a popular instrument um, uh, to use. It's, it's like a five page document. It's just kind of standardized. So a lot of companies just use that um, as a, kind of a quick and dirty way to raise money. Um, and it just, it's, it's preferable for companies at, at the earliest stage because it doesn't cost a whole lot to get the legal uh, work done to draw up these documents. It's much, much cheaper. It's really fast and it's easy to do. Um, and it punts on some of the biggest issues like what's the valuation of the company. It doesn't set a valuation on the company today. It might have a valuation cap, which says that the note can't convert at higher valuation than X, but that's kind of forward looking. So anyway, it's, it's, it's generally what tech companies, which are my types of clients uh, use at the earliest stage. It might not make sense for like maybe a, a mom and pop shop who doesn't actually ever expect to raise institutional money in an equity financing that would cause these instruments to convert. But um, for any company that does plan on raising money from institutional investors, uh, this is oftentimes the most logical choice. And then, and then, of course, um, you know, if, if you if your company is going strong and you've grown enough and you, you become visible, uh, you have a lot to offer. You get to the point where you can actually start talking to, you know, venture capital funds. Uh, we talked about the institutional investor investors in different contexts earlier. So if you get to this point, like you know, congratulations, um, and then you start really engaging in complicated um, discussions of how you're gonna. Um, bring in the funds and how to like, sort of restructure your company so that you're offering certain things like, you know, most, more, most often uh, preferred stock um, to these um, in the investors that are coming in in VC forms. Mm. So how do we define an accredited investor? So the definition actually was updated just recently, but I mean, not, not in any kind of real material respect. I think right now it's defined as if your net worth is above a million dollars, excluding your primary residence, or your um, your income is over two hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars annually, and I think that might be like for the past couple of years or three years or something like that. So um, yeah, that's that's uh, if I, my memory serves me right, I think that's the current definition. It, it's a weird rule that, that it's counterintuitive to most people, but basically the SEC has determined that if you make less than $200,000 a year, you are not competent to make your own investment decisions. Um, and it's unbelievable. I, I think it's probably the worst rule that anybody's ever come up with. There are some exceptions. Um, there's a there's an exception in Reg D that what it lets you take on like 35 unaccredited investors. Um, but it's it's really complicated. It's really easy to run afoul of the securities laws. And if you're going to raise any kind of substantial money, you really need to look out for it. Very good to know. Um, so, Chad, tell us a little bit about your experience with fundraising from the very beginning till up till now. Yeah, uh, so we've actually looked at or done all of these, uh, started out bootstrapping it ourselves. Uh, put in our own cash and then raise the friends and family round um, where basically everyone either knew us directly or was one step removed and did that as a convertible note and then raised an angel round um, led by, and that's where it's people with money that don't necessarily know you. Um, so ours was actually led by a bunch of NFL players um, and that also was a convertible note. Um, and then did an equity round of financing that was mainly our existing investors putting in with a couple of small VCs and now um, doing a VC uh, raise and at the same time actually doing um, some sort of debt raise as well. 
Um, and so it's, uh, it's not a fun process. Billions of people say no to you every time. Uh, I guess unless you're rich and you're going the other way around where you have your, you're the ones funding your own companies and ideas or going out and buying other companies. But um, I think it's, um, it's important to remember you don't need everyone to say, yeah. like you just can get away with a few people saying yes. We were talking about it earlier, we have 63 people on our cap table. Um, so 63 people that own equity in our company, uh, which is a lot. And uh, as a CEO, it takes up a lot of time. Um, and so we're actually in a unique position where we're trying to reduce that number and none of them want to sell their stock, but rather they all want to put in more money, uh, which is a great problem to have and very thankful to have that problem rather than everyone being like, I need my money back. Um, but there's, I think it's, there's always challenges with fundraising, regardless of how well you're doing and what side of the world you're on. And um, I agree though, in terms of making sure you understand everyone's accredited, having everyone sign documents saying that they are, et cetera. Um, one other hack I've learned is to be an accredited investor. They can count, like if you're a founder, for example, and your company's worth over, if your equity stake is on paper worth over a million dollars, that apparently counts uh, as an accredited investor as well. Hmm. Yeah, we we have avoided some like you know, uh, Chat was talking about how he has you know sixty five people on his um, on his cap table. We were talking about this earlier. We avoided that by we brought all of our friends and family for both of the companies that we started into a limited partnership. They invested in a limited partnership. And then my private equity firm is the general partner. And then that fund uh, invested into the company that we started. And what you end up with is you end up with, uh, we aggregate you know, dozens and dozens of people into a single entity that's apart from the company. And at the end, your cap table has one line on it. Uh, and it's not only cleaner in the cap table, but it's ultimately better for your friends and family, we think, because you know, if your grandma puts in five grand and she's five grand on a cap table of a company that's worth a million dollars, nobody cares about her. But if you aggregate that money into say $500,000 and that line on the cap table is $500,000, the person speaking for all the friends and family, which is usually me or the, or the general partner, uh, has a little bit more clout uh, with everyone. And so it's, it's one way of, of uh, sort of protecting the initial investors because I don't know how, how far you've gone down the road, but I've seen a lot of companies, you know, do down rounds and things like that and, and, and be around for a lot. And friends and family are the people who get screwed 100% of the time. The later investors always somehow get their money out, but the people who believed in you when nobody else did get screwed in the end. And so whatever you can do to prevent that is, is going to be very helpful. Yeah. And I think at some point we'll probably do an event just on fundraising. So we'll get to go a lot deeper into this topic since I know it's of interest to a lot of people. Um, so we're running kind of close to time. If everyone, I mean, whoever's able to stay a little bit longer, please do. I'd like to kind of get to a, a couple of um, more questions and some just general topics. Um, so before kind of just briefly touching on this, when to engage a lawyer, um, I do want to look at a couple of the questions that have come in so we can try and get those answered. Um, so one person has asked, what are the differences and limitations of the different entity types when it comes to equity compensation for early hires? I can speak a little bit to this. So I would say that corporations have the are the easiest to, to work with for uh, equity comp. For employees, um, you can do a stock option. You can adopt a stock option plan and issue options or restricted stock to your employees. That's the, I would say, the cleanest and easiest way to do equity comp for employees. If you're an LLC, it gets a little bit messier. So you've got concept called profits interest units that you could issue to people, uh, which are a little bit more complicated, but they're kind of akin to options in a way. Um, I mean, I'm told there is a way to kind of do options with LLCs, but it's it's messy and weird. So I, I find that it, um, being a corporation gives you the, the, the best flexibility um, to do equity comp in a few different ways. Yeah, 
Makes sense. Um, we also have a clarification on exit strategies, um, personal tax ramifications. So you have an LLC or S Corp and a C Corp wants to buy you out using their stock. So Troy says, I believe we're immediately taxed on the buyout price. So if your business is bought at, let's say, $4 million in stock, we owe the IRS taxes on the $4 million that year, even though it's stock. Um, it's a complicated so, question, but it's uh, in the yeah, chat box from Troy, if you'd like and to very read it. specific. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so first of all, if you're an LLC and you're taxed at the partnership or you're an S-Corp and you have the flow through taxation, you know, the, the ta I guess the tax impact is it's uh, you don't have a you, you wouldn't have a double uh, taxation issue in that in that situation, really, regardless of structure. It's, it's the, t the tax issue is going to be directly for the, the partners or the, the members um, or the shareholders in this in this case, if it's S-Corp. Um, if you're getting all stock for your equity, I mean, so that's one thing that's not clarified in the question is they're buying you out, but what, what are they buying? Are they buying the equity in the company? Are they buying your assets? Um, what are they, what are they getting from you? So if they're buying your equity in your company and they're giving you equity in their company as the consideration, I have to think about it, but I mean, my initial impression is I think that actually might be might be a tax-free exchange because you're essentially, if, you're, if your business is worth $4 million today, that's the value of your equity and you're giving that $4 million of equity to them and they're giving you $4 million of their stock, you know, the value is the same. So it should be a tax-free <coughs> transaction in that case, but I'm not a tax attorney, so I do reserve the right to ask a tax attorney. Yes. I, I, have, I have this exact issue right now. I have a call with Alex and Paul tomorrow. Uh, so we're, we're buying a company for, I don't know what the price is, say a million bucks. And we're doing an all equity deal. And the problem for the people we're buying it from is uh, they're going to get a million dollars in equity in our new company. And they're, we're worried that that's going to create a $200,000, $250,000 tax event for them. Um, there are ways to get around it. It is very complicated. You definitely need a lawyer, or in my case, a team of lawyers. Um, so uh, there are ways to do it, but you have to be very careful, and you have to really talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. Good answer. Um, now, we have a, a question that also came in about trade secrets. What do companies typically keep as proof in case a trade secret gets leaked and they need to take legal action? That's a very subjective um, litigation. We're getting to litigation territory here. I mean, I, I know how these cases play out. The, the cases play out by emails. It's almost always emails. There you, go. Yeah. you can't prove that something was your, your trade secret necessarily. You can just prove that somebody stole it. And, uh, and you prove it by, you get all their emails and people are so stupid. They talk about how they're stealing the trade secrets and they share them and they send documents that have the old company letterhead on it and things like that. And you just catch them. It happened with the Uber employee that went to Waymo, right? or the other way around, I think, right? Yep. Mm. Well, so now actually we're sort of on this topic about engaging a lawyer, or can I do it myself? So uh, what would your answer to this be, Alex? I mean, I, I think I'm a little biased, but, um, you know, obviously the earlier the better. When, when you're setting up a business, I, I guess, like, ultimately it, it may depend on um, – you know, what your vision for your company is. Uh, if you have any any level of aspirations to grow your company to, a, to an appreciable size, um, you know, there, there are a lot of thoughts that you might want to um, put into the, the beginning the company so that not only are you setting up your company correctly and properly, but you, you also love a lot of flexibility. And, and to do that, uh, you really have to have like proper documentation in place like in the beginning. Um, I cannot tell you how many times and how often uh, we have just, you know, clients coming, um, knocking on our door and um, asking to fix problems that, that basically involve um, having to backtrack on, on the structure of the business and like the disputes that are, uh, arise from having, you know, like the founder disputes because like documentation wasn't done properly. What, what have you, like there are like slew of reasons why um, things might go sideways. Um, but bottom line is, and this, this by it, probably, this might actually speak more directly to, to people who are thinking about starting a business, is I, I, I find that almost invariably true 
that um, investing a little bit on the front end actually ends up saving you a lot of money on the back end. That's just like, you know, the front end is like deal, deal lawyers like myself and George. Um, back end um, is like litigation lawyers like, like Rich. Um, you don't want to do both is, is basically my point. Um, you know, you might end up having to litigate for other reasons anyway, but if you, 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 you obviously want to do everything in your power to set yourself up so that um, you, you're preventing um, things going things going sideways as much as you can. And um, I think one of the best ways to do this is to, to engage a lawyer on, on the front end um, and then just kind of work, you know, bounce ideas and work through early problems and whatnot. So we want to see people like Alex and George and avoid seeing people like Rich is the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's you know, obviously Alex is going to say you need to hire a lawyer immediately because he, he's one of the lawyers you would hire, and Alex and George, but but I am a lawyer and, and Alex is my lawyer and we hired them very, very early on because, you know, I can fake my way through it up to a point, uh, and, but once you start getting any level of complexity, you need somebody who really knows what they're talking about, really knows what they're doing. And that is going to be uh, a specialized person. Uh, and it might be a team of specialized people. You might need a tax person. You might need somebody who forms corporations. You, you, know, you know, might need four or five different people. Um, so it's not an accident that Alec work, Alex works at a big firm that has those sorts of resources, but it's also not an accident that I hired somebody that uh, you know, Alex works in Atlanta. He doesn't work in Silicon Valley or he doesn't work in, in, in you know, New York because you're not really paying the time. I'm not really paying the top dollar that you would pay for a really big New York firm or a really big Silicon Valley firm. And, and I think that's really a nice way to go. And that was our, you know, how we did it um, when we got started. And, you know, a, a firm like Nelson Mullins will give you every bit as good advice and every bit of, do every bit as good work for literally half the price of some of the, the other firms. So, it's worth shopping around. It's, it's worth looking for uh, a good um, representation right from the beginning. The other thing you're going to want to consider is other other people like financial professionals and things like that, uh, accountants, uh, auditors, if you need it for your uh, for your investors and things like that. Yeah. So somebody just raised a question, which or a comment in the comment box. I thought is important to reiterate. The person said it's important to engage in an attorney who understands startups. I strongly agree. <laughs> So it is kind of a niche area and, um, and you don't want to engage, I would say, just any general practitioner because there's a certain specialized knowledge in this area that's, that's needed, I think, to, to work well and make the right best decisions. And also, if you engage an attorney that specializes in this area, uh, they can help connect you or introduce you to investors in the community that you might want to be introduced to. Um, and also, they'll have an understanding of what's market, what's not market in in this uh in this area so that's that's all very valuable and important yeah so and sean actually raised an interesting question what's the best way to hire a lawyer how do you know if a lawyer is good yeah i think you want to a couple things one and i want to reiterate as a non-attorney to always hire lawyers but um i think you want to use word of mouth you want to see uh who's worked with them before what they liked what they didn't like um, our attorney right now for, um, for our regular corporate work actually randomly was my TA in college and we worked on a deal together back when I was an investment banker and he was client side. So he was like the person I should have hated the most. Um, and I went to him more than I went to our own attorneys. So I just like kept that in the back of my mind, stayed in touch. And when I was ready to start my company, I was like, Hey, I need your help. Um, but I, I think it's, Definitely important to look at that. Look at um, what Rich is saying, like just reputation. It's really easy to find people's reputation, especially lawyers. Um, and then who um, you're comfortable with, I think is super important too. Regardless of the firm uh, that they're at, you got to make sure that they're giving you the time that you want and um, that they're kind of prioritizing you. I always joke with ours that he would rather spend time with me than someone who's paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars, which means that he must be a terrible attorney. And he's always like, no, we're, we're assuming one day you'll pay your bills. Um, but no, all kidding aside, I think it is really important to talk to others and get feedback on people's feedback with uh, specific attorneys. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely something that we're building with this entrepreneurs group here. I mean, um, part of this is also for, you know, sharing resources, recommendations, referrals. So um, that's also something that you can, you know, look to this group for. So um, so we do want to wrap it up. Um, quick comment about Cooley Go. Um, what would you like to, to tell people about Cooley Go, guys? George, do you want to? Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's a good resource bank of various forms. It's, it's cookie cutter, though. It's not, it, there's nothing customized for you in your particular situation. I mean, it's, it's a fairly helpful tool to generate some documents, but it's honestly, I wouldn't just rely on that. I would still engage an attorney who can speak to your situation and give you specialized legal advice. I mean, there's state law issues that need to be addressed depending on what state you're in that, you know, Cooley Go just isn't going to take into account. So still one, one, advice, buddy. <laughs> one, one thing I can say um, is um, Cooley Go and there, there's some other similar um, sites that, that can generate like these legal documents. But well, one thing I, I, I will say that I, that actually is helpful um, if you go into a website like Cooley Go is um, it's, it's a good learning resource. Mm -hmm. You can just go in there, just like, you know, uh, click around, read through whatever they got on their website right. and just kind of gain some like very baseline um, uh, knowledge. Because um, even if you do hire a lawyer, it, it's always helpful to know more than know less, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right, going back lawyer. to knowing the vocabulary, having a little bit exactly. more personal understanding of things. Yeah, and it's it, it's just it's just it's just always helpful to know yeah. more um, and know what you're talking about, or you know, um, even if you do have a lawyer. So that's yeah, something absolutely. To so just to um, conclude real fast, so kind of the five main considerations we talked about. So engaging a lawyer from the beginning, considering liability, tax implications, and investor requirements when deciding on your entity type, establishing clear IT ownership, particularly if you have a tech or a product that you, um, you know, is, is your main asset, avoiding 50-50 ownership, having all founders sign vesting agreements, and using convertible notes or saves at first for raising money and making sure you ensure investors are accredited. So again, we'll be sending out this presentation and then later the recording. So all of this and some notes will be with it. Um, in the meantime, well, thank you so much to all the panelists. This has been extremely valuable. Um, thank you everyone so much for your enthusiastic participation. Um, it's been, I, I certainly learned a lot. So I hope that everyone else did too. Um, if you have any more questions about, we'll be sending a follow-up by email. If you have any more questions about uh, who's in, on, in entrepreneurship. If you have feedback about this event, if you're interested in getting more involved, um, you can go ahead and send me an email. Um, but that's that's it. So thank you everyone and best of luck with all your ventures. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate the time that you took to share with us. So have a good night, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Good night.